LSU, um, School of Environmental and Natural Resources, uh, the College of uh, Food, Ag, and Environmental Sciences. Um, I, I've known Robin now. Actually, the first time I think I met you was at an IAGLA conference. Was it the one that was in Purdue, I think? Yeah. yeah. Uh, but Robin's doing some fantastic work. Um, you've gotten, you've gotten the opportunity to hear a lot about some of the um, harmful algal bloom issues and nutrient loading and toxin work. Um, and all of those talks kind of come back to the farm. Right? We know that 65 to 85% of that nutrients is, is coming from non-point source ag-related practices. Closer to the 85% on that. Well, Robin is just doing some amazing stuff. And I don't want to steal her thunder here, but she's really doing some great work. And what's that? No, it's fantastic. You're so, so sure. Um, Robin's doing a lot of the work from the social science aspect. So she's really going out and surveying the farmers and feeling like, what is their willingness to, to, to change? Are they willing to change? What changes are they willing to do? So it's this kind of stuff. As, as scientists sit in the room and find out, hey, this is the problem, and here's the silver bullet, bullet solution, if that solution doesn't fit into societal happenings, and you know the solution doesn't fit into the farmers' daily lives and, and their bottom line, then that solution may not be something that's embraced. We really need to know the attitudes of the people that live in this watershed and, uh, and that are potentially part of the problem and can be part of the solution. So as usual, I've asked, uh, asked Robin to kind of talk to you uh, um, about kind of her career path for the first couple of minutes here before she gets into her presentation. Um, and so if we could all welcome Dr. Dr. Lynch. Well, I'm excited to be here. I came, I think, three years ago. I was invited to come up and give the talk. I know Doug was here. I'm sure there was a couple other faculty maybe here too, but it's nice to be back. And I'll actually talk, I talked about the same project then. It's nearing the end now. That was at the beginning. So I um, have some kind of new things to share with you. But yeah, as far as my kind of how did I get here, what's my story, for those of you maybe wondering what you want to do in the future and if you're thinking about research or academia or things like that, um, I have a very crooked path sort of story that interestingly now is kind of full circle. So it's kind of an interesting one. But I actually grew up on a farm in Northwest Ohio and was this kind of big 4-H girl, um, wanted to be a veterinarian, spent probably a good 10 years of my life preparing to be a veterinarian, volunteering for vet clinics, doing the 4-H thing, raising animals, all this kind of thing. Um, and then when I was looking at undergraduate schools, I was thinking of like kind of pre-med, pre-vet program, something with a biology focus. Um, and then in the back of my mind, I was like, you know, but I kind of like environmental things, and so maybe I should go somewhere where a good plan B would be some sort of environmental science environmental studies type program. I looked at small schools, so I ended up going to Denison University, if anyone's familiar with that, a little bit east of Columbus. And I picked it because it had this good kind of pre-med, pre-vet biology program. Lots of people ended up going into those sorts of professional careers. Um, but it had this new environmental studies program. I was like, that kind of sounds like a good plan B. Um, so probably halfway through my first semester, my freshman year of college, I realized I was going to do plan B. So it didn't take me very long, and I think it was a zoology class. Um, as we moved from kind of molecular and cellular level things up to kind of more macro level concepts and we got into conservation biology, I, I, that all started to click a little bit more with me and it was something I felt a little more excited about. So I really quickly shifted into the environmental studies program and just doing a concentration in wildlife management, um, which at Denison you could kind of specialize in weird things like that, even though it was a small school, um, did a study abroad program in Kenya, went into this kind of thinking I'm going to more of a kind of wildlife management, wildlife ecology route. Um, and then I did a senior honors thesis, and um, it was meant to be a comparison of kind of um, management strategies for white-tailed deer in urban areas across the kind of three big cities in Columbus, so sort of in Ohio, the three Ps. Um, and as I got into that project, it turned into this kind of comparison of how stakeholders got involved in management and how the outcomes in these different cities through their metro parks had really changed as a result of how they engaged stakeholders. Um, and so I shifted into this kind of human dimension side of wildlife issues and started thinking more about social issues and stakeholder involvement. Um, and I ended up getting a job after graduation with the Ohio EPA for a couple of years. Um, got tired of that pretty quick. Decided to go back to graduate. Almost anything else about that? Um, decided to go back to graduate school. And I was looking at programs, and I still thought wildlife conservation, something along those lines, maybe that kind of thinks about things in a couple systems away, where you think about the humans and the and the critters and think about how they interact. Um, and I was calling around different places, and my husband, I had gotten married, and my husband had gotten a job in Columbus. And he said, well, could you look at Ohio State? And I was like, no, I can't look at Ohio State um, because they don't have a wildlife conservation program. I'm going to go to, like, Idaho or Minnesota or UMass Amherst. They're all these places with the University of Maine. Um, and I was like, but, you know, you've got a job. Why don't I check it out? So as I'm talking to faculty there, I, someone says, you know, you should really talk to this new guy that's coming. He's a behavioral decision scientist. I was like, well, I don't really know what that is, but sure, I'll talk to him. And he was 
coming from University of British Columbia. I have a phone conversation with him, and it was like love at first sight. He totally hit it off. I was excited about everything he was doing. Decided to go and do my master's at Ohio State with him in the School of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, Focus again, kind of wildlife as a context, but looking at kind of quality of decisions and how different types of information processing impacts the way that people make decisions about environmental issues. Um, and then as I was finishing that, I was looking at the job market, and this same advisor said, well, do you want to stay and do a PhD? And I was like, no, I don't. Actually, I've never really had any idea of doing that in my life. And he's like, well, I'll buy you a new computer. And I was like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I signed up. Signed on the dotted line. I was like, that sounds good. Um, so anyway, so I kind of stumbled into this whole path in a lot of ways. Um, I'm glad that I did that now, but it certainly was never kind of the grand design, but just kind of different doors open at different times. Um, and then interestingly, over the last nine years now, incredibly, in my faculty position, I've, I've somehow gotten pulled back into like agricultural work. So this is the full circle. I feel like I've come home again to my farm roots. <laughs> I'm doing all this work, even in the area I grew up in, which is Northwest Ohio, um, looking at how farmers make decisions about uh, management issues that impact environmental quality. I also do work in a lot of other areas around um, decision making under risk and uncertainty for environmental issues, issues in public health, um, issues in agriculture. So it's not just ag that I focus on, but I'm getting pulled a lot more into that than I probably ever would have thought of even when I started my um, academic career. So that's just a little kind of background. And then somehow I managed to get hired back at Ohio State too. So that's where I am now. Um, they must have liked me a lot. They let me come back. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of my path. And like I said, I'm a behavioral decision scientist. So really what I focus on is how people make decisions. There's a lot of cognitive psychology built into, from a kind of theoretical perspective, into what I do. Um, there's a subfield in cognitive psychology um, and, and kind of quantitative psychology called judgment and decision making. That's a lot of what I focus on, and a lot of that area is really thinking about risk and uncertainty because um, the, the challenging decisions are the ones you have to make under risk and uncertainty, right? So if we knew everything was 100% certainty, if we knew what the outcomes would be, decisions would be really easy, right? Um, and, as humans, we have a tendency to make decisions doing kind of using a um, what we call experiential or kind of intuitive way, emotional way of thinking often. Um, and some of those kind of patterns of decision making fall apart pretty quickly in really complex types of situations where we haven't had the ability to kind of learn the cues that help us make good decisions using our intuition or using our gut or using kind of past experience. Um, so a lot of that field is really looking at those kind of complex um, and a couple systems are a good example of that, but these complex decision contexts where we don't have a lot of experience, there's a lot of risk, there's a lot of uncertainty, and how do we help people make better decisions under those types of conditions? So that's a lot of what I do generally. Like I said, I've gotten um, extremely involved, and in, I think in 2011 this project was funded by the NSF, um, it's a couple of systems project, um, actually looking at um, connections between how we design policy, how farmers respond to that policy in terms of the management decisions that they make on their farm, how those decisions then change the way that nutrients move across the landscape. So we're using the Maumee watershed as our kind of um, case study system, if you will. And then we have hydrologists and others on the team who are then looking at how those changes in nutrients kind of flow through the watershed and end up in the lake. And then we have people looking at the ecosystem services in the lake and how they change as those kind of low streams. And then ultimately we link that back into the human system by looking at um, how people then respond to changes in the lake. Right? So if the lake gets better, it gets worse. If the services improve, we have uh, more access to better beaches with cleaner water and better fishing opportunities. How does that impact the way that people think about and act when it comes to the lake? And then vice versa, right, if things get worse. So that's the kind of um, context that I'm working in. And um, what I'll highlight is I'll kind of talk generally. We've actually done three surveys now um, since 2011 uh, with farmers. The first two were in the Maumee. The second, or the last one we did this year was the entire Western Lake Erie Basin, so at the Kentucky Watershed. So I'll talk a little broadly about kind of findings across the study and trends that we're seeing in the way that farmers are thinking about this issue and the, uh, the management practices that they're putting in place. Um, but I'll also then highlight specifically we have um, several different projects looking at specific practices, but we have a paper that hopefully will come out pretty soon um, in the journal Great Lakes Research looking at timing decisions that farmers make. So that's one of the kind of specific examples that I'll walk through towards the end of the talk. So. There we go. Well, I could, I could probably skip right past this first slide, so I probably don't need a lot, of, spend a lot of time um, talking to you about this. When I first started talking about this project, um, it was probably right before the 2011 blooms, which were maybe some of the, the first kind of bloom in recent time that got everyone's attention, kind of got the media coverage, got people kind of thinking about what was going on in the lake. 
Um, but typically, as humans, we tend to kind of ignore often these sorts of environmental issues and still the things, until the things we really care about start to be impacted, right? So when our fishing opportunities, recreationally or commercially, start to decline, right, some of these stuff we care because there's an economic impact, maybe there's a personal kind of value that's impacted. Um, when beaches close, right, because the, the water's too toxic for you to be near it. Um, when our property values are impacted, right, it costs a lot of money to buy properties, right, on, on water bodies. Um, so as we see kind of changes in the environment, like the algal issues we've been seeing in Lake Erie um, over many decades, but the most kind of recent ones are the ones we've been focusing on, um, people start to care, right, when they see those services that the lake provides um, are going to be impacted by that. Um, and so we've seen these kind of increasing trends here recently, and so there's been a lot of work by um, people in this room and others looking at this issue, trying to figure out, you know, what's going on with these current blooms, what's the real cause of that. Um, we talked about this actually a little bit at dinner. Um, what's going on here currently? Um, well, it's really a combination of um, farming practices and also kind of changes in the local climate. And so you can uh, find a lot. You can find the phosphorus task force report online and kind of see the work that a lot of kind of multi-teams have, have um, looked into this issue. Here's just one paper from PNAS that gets into this issue a little bit, but it's basically showing that, um, and then I should say my opinion, just to be clear, um, that what farmers are doing isn't necessarily bad but maybe what farmers are doing isn't good enough anymore, right? So we're seeing these changes. We're seeing kind of increased big um, storm events in the spring. We're seeing the lake warmer in the summer, and a lot of you probably know you're here studying this summer um, that, that Lake Erie is very sensitive to these sorts of changes, right? It's a shallow lake, and so it's going to be sensitive to these kind of changes in temperature. Um, and so that combination of things is pretty problematic. So maybe it's not that what farmers are doing is necessarily bad, but maybe it's just not good enough anymore, right? That so we have this kind of climate adaptation problem. We're going to have to shift our status quo into something that's going to be a little bit better to prevent some of these problems that we're seeing. And that's pretty much what you're hearing. So um, this is just a quote from, I think, that second task force report. Um, there's multiple contributors to what's going on in the lake, but certainly the finger has been pointed quite a bit at agriculture, that about 85% of the um, phosphorus load that's coming into the Western Lake Erie Basin from the Maumee River is coming from agriculture and from the application of fertilizers, um, synthetic and Newer. Um, and, but, so it's important that we know that, but right, but we also know that the rainfall patterns, the storm events, the warmer summers aren't going to change. That's something we can't really do anything about. Um, so if we can't really change that, the only way we can really address this problem is through changes in human behavior. Right? So we're going to have to go back to the kind of root cause of that problem and do something about it. And if 85% of that problem is the way that land is being managed in agriculture, then that's where we're going to have to start. Right? Or that's at least where we have the biggest chance of making a difference. And so since then, you know, this was kind of some of the earlier work. There was a there was a first task force report that probably came out in 2010. I'm not sure. Um, so you know, early on, it was kind of figuring out well, what's causing the problem, right? The first thing we have to do is we're seeing these increased kind of the increased frequency and severity of harmful algal blooms. First thing we have to do from kind of basic science standpoint is figure out what's causing that, right? So pretty quickly, a lot of smart people kind of figured out well, phosphorus. Um, largely dissolved reactive phosphorus is a soluble form that's coming into the lake, causing these problems. And then more recently, the, the shift has been to kind of figuring out, okay, well, what, so if we know that's what the problem is, what can we be telling farmers to do, and how much change is it going to take to actually fix the problem, right? So there was a um, fairly recent recommendation from last year that we need to see a 40% reduction in total phosphorus coming into the lake um, as a way to kind of combat this issue. So this is both the soluble form of phosphorus, which is kind of the the thing we've seen the biggest increase in in the last couple decades, but also the particulate form, the form that comes through soil erosion kind of attached, right, to, um, to soil and farm fields. So that, that number has been placed out there, but that's a goal, right, that we need to see this 40% reduction. And then we've also seen um, recommended practices come out, right? So if we want to get to that 40% reduction, what are the things we should be telling farmers to do? Um, and there's all kinds of things. You can go and look this up. Um, in terms of recommendations, but you're seeing recommendations like manure storage. So one of the problems is if a farmer is using manure as their form of fertilizer and they have a livestock operation and they have a whole bunch of manure in the middle of the winter and they're not supposed to put it on frozen ground, what are they going to do with it, right? So for people that have this kind of timing issue when it comes to applying that particular form of fertilizer, um, one way to deal with that might be better manure storage facilities, right? So they could hold on to it until a more appropriate time to apply it. Um, another uh, really highly recommended practice even more recently is the idea of subsurface placement. So the idea is that, and this is part of what we talked about at dinner, that back in the kind of 80s, 
probably when this started. Um, Lake Erie was also having phosphorus problems, but it was more of a particulate-based phosphorus problem. And so there's been, well, that was even earlier than that, but in the 80s, there was this big push in agriculture to use no-till um, practices on the farm. And part of that was to decrease erosion, right? So the less you turn over the soil and manipulate the soil over the course of the year, uh, the more likely that soil is to stay on the field, the less phosphorus you have running off or, or leaving the field through um, soil loss. So there's this big push, a pretty successful push, and so a lot of farmers in Northwest Ohio have adopted no-till practices. Um, but along with that, and probably other factors as well, but one thing that's been um, kind of talked about is that then when you're not tilling the soil, you're more likely to broadcast apply your fertilizer, right? So you, want to, you don't want to disrupt the soil surface. You've decided to not disrupt the soil, so the easiest way to apply fertilizer is to drive as quickly as possible across those fields and spray your fertilizer out, right? And so then that leaves that fertilizer just kind of sitting on the surface, waiting for a rainstorm to wash it away. Um, and there's other kind of things that play into that, but that's one potential thing. So again, I think it comes back to this point of, you know, farmers aren't purposely doing bad things, right? It's not that they're doing anything wrong per se, but it might even be that some of those things we recommended several decades ago have led to other changes in practice that have had some unexpected consequences, right? And in a couple kind of complex system, it's hard to foresee all of that, right? And then you see those things happening, and then you have to kind of backpedal and figure out, okay, well, now what do we tell them to do? So there's been a push for this idea of subsurface placement, and that's because we don't want to go backwards and tell farmers to start tilling up the soil and incorporating their fertilizer, but they could use different methods that actually inject the fertilizer beneath the soil surface without completely tilling over that soil and disrupting the soil. So it's a good kind of compromise way to keep some of those no-till practices in place, but to make sure that fertilizer gets beneath the surface and is less likely to be lost during these kind of rainfall events. Um, another big push has been to use winter cover crops. So you know, in the 50s, probably everybody was using cover crops, and then as kind of large-scale ag and um, other kind of uh, technological advances in agriculture came, people kind of moved away from that practice. Now there's a big push to go back towards that, right? That having something growing or something ex existing on the surface of that field throughout the winter is really good for a lot of things. It's good for water quality because it retains nutrients. It's good for soil health because it breaks up that soil. Um, and so that's another push. Um, similar to that, including wheat or a small grain in your rotation, which is not economically popular. Um, there's not a good market for wheat and things like that, so people are less likely to want to do that. Um, and then other kind of water control structures. Um, that certainly could be helpful. So we're at the point where I think we, we know what the problem is for the most part. We kind of know what we need to do to fix the problem, um, both at kind of large scale in terms of our goals, but also at a specific level. So what sorts of things do we need, need farmers to do? So this project that I'm a part of just kind of happened um, to start before a lot of this kind of blew up, I think, around my year. Um, so we're kind of towards the end of it now. But the goal of this project was really to answer this question of whether or not we could offset the predicted impacts of climate change on Lake Erie through changes in human behavior. So back to this idea that if this is a combination of kind of farmer behavior and climate change that's causing the problem, we can't stop climate change or fix climate change, at least not in the short term. Um, and so all we can do is address that behavior. And so in our project, we're looking at kind of what leads to different policies being put in place to address this issue. How then do farmers respond to that in terms of the types of management decisions they make on individual fields? Uh, then how does that change the way, again, like I said, nutrients kind of move across that landscape? Um, ultimately, how did those changes then change the amount of phosphorus loading that's coming into Lake Erie? How do the services the lake provides change? And then how do people respond to that, to that system, the downstream system, as it changes over time? And then ultimately, we throw in this kind of climate change driver to look at um, under different climate scenarios, right? So there might be a policy and a responding change in behavior that's really effective under a kind of um, best case scenario climate change. Um, and then there might be a policy like that that doesn't work at all under kind of worst case scenario climate change. So we can look at different climate change scenarios to see, you know, how much more do we have to do under scenarios where the temperature really gets a lot higher in the summer, right? Or where we see even more kind of big spring rain. So we're trying to look at that kind of variable as well. So my part of the project is really to look at that farmer decision making and ultimately to kind of think about when a policy is passed, what makes that policy effective? It doesn't just naturally lead to a desired outcome, right? I mean, we can all think of examples of well-intentioned policy and regulation <laughs> that's been put out there that didn't really end um, the way that people thought it would. Um, there's lots of funny examples of that. The one I always like to give that I think is just a good one nothing to do with water quality or the environment, um, was when uh, seatbelts became mandatory. 
what actually happened was people started driving faster. So suddenly I feel really safe, right? So now I have to wear my seatbelt, so I'm going to comply with that policy. But now I can drive really fast, so I'm super safe. So what happened is that we actually saw an increase in vehicle collisions as a result of people driving more recklessly. Um, so we might not have seen as many people die because now they're buckled in, um, but you're actually seeing another kind of set of impacts that maybe you didn't, you didn't see coming. Um, and so one of the things I think is overlooked a lot, and that's not even a complex system, right? That's just a simple sort of safety sort of regulation, is that we assume we can put policies and laws and regulations into place, and then automatically we get some sort of desired outcome, right? That there's no unforeseen consequences. Everyone behaves the right way. Everyone says, oh, sure, I'll just go out and do that. I'll do whatever you say. Um, but ultimately, there's a lot of complexity right here in terms of how people respond to those policies, right? And so to get that desired outcome, you have to get the right individuals to change the right behavior. Right? And so in the case of this particular issue, we need to get farmers, those are the right individuals, right, if they're the kind of main cause of the issue, to change the right behaviors, right? Because if they went out and suddenly 100% of them put cover crops on their farm, but that wasn't going to have any kind of net positive impact on the lake, then that's a big waste of our time, right? So we need to think about what are those things we need to do, how do we get those people to do it? And furthermore, I think what social science can bring to this is we already kind of know who the right people are, we already kind of know what the right behaviors are generally, but maybe we need to target those behaviors to certain types of farmers, right? Maybe it's really big farms that need to act differently. Maybe it's the really small farms. Maybe it's older farmers who are kind of the bad actors. Um, maybe in some of the slot modeling, the kind of hydrological work is showing that there's these, you know, these, these kind of target areas like high slope fields where we see more phosphorus coming off. So maybe we need to target those farmers who have kind of fields that are on higher slope, more likely to lose nutrients in that way. Um, and so we need to start to think about that question a little bit more. So as a behavioral scientist, we talk about spurring behavior change, one of the things that I think a lot of people um, have a kind of incorrect assumption about is that if we want someone to do something different, we just need to educate them, right? So I'm going to stand up here and say, like, education is not the key to everything. Um, so sometimes we think we can just go out and tell someone, well, hey, haven't you noticed that the lake's been looking kind of bad? Haven't you noticed that we've had these big blooms and that we ought to shut down their water system for three days? And haven't you noticed these things? And aren't you worried? And here's what you can do. Why don't you just go out and do it? Well, so that, if it was that simple, we would have solved lots of problems by now. Um, but people are not quite that simple, right? Often, for a lot of big environmental issues, there are highly educated, very knowledgeable people who do silly, stupid stuff, right? And that's just really normal. That's kind of human nature. Um, and so what we do as social scientists is we go kind of a step behind that idea of knowledge and education and just help people understand the problem, help them understand what they need to do and look at all of those factors that are kind of playing into what they're actually doing. Um, what are their values? That's kind of a core level. What things do they get really excited about? What things do they get really upset about? Um, we look at their kind of specific beliefs. Um, one of the beliefs we'll talk about a lot today is efficacy and this idea of um, believing that a practice actually works. And that's one of the most critical things to get someone to take that final step and actually change their behavior. Um, you have social norms, right? You might have a really motivated farmer wants to do something different, but everyone around him is doing the kind of status quo, and so he's really uncomfortable being different, right? Because the social norm says that we don't do cover crops, which is probably pretty true right now in agriculture. Um, and so ultimately, if we have a better understanding of these things that are kind of playing into how we make those decisions, um, we can actually then change those behaviors, and like I said, hopefully get to the outcomes that we want, right? The kind of nice, everyone's happy at the beach outcome, not this sort of outcome. And so, again, I think this gets overlooked a lot. I think a lot of times we think, one, we can just figure out what a problem is, tell people about it, and then automatically we get to kind of a solution to the problem, right? But there's this kind of behavioral piece that's pretty critical. Uh, so when we talk about achieving those desired outcomes and impacting people's behavior or even kind of maybe bypassing people's behavior, there's kind of three categories of solutions that are out there. Um, the first are what we kind of call technological fixes. Um, so this would be something like in the case of uh, Lake Erie and kind of microcystin or um, blue-green algae that if you're seeing these big issues, like for instance when Toledo had to um, shut down their water system, um, that the way we would fix that problem is we would just get better water treatment facilities, right? We'll just get better at removing those toxins from the water, problem solved. Um, the problem with that is yes, it fixes the problem of kind of clean water to drink, but it bypasses the cause of the problem, right, which is human behavior. So you still have farmers doing what they're always doing, they're still ending up with too much phosphorus in the lake, we're just kind of fixing it at the kind of uh, point of entry, if you will, for humans, right? So if we can just fix it right there where it impacts us, right, we solve the problem. Um, sometimes technological fixes could be great, but I always caution people to think kind of carefully about whether or not you want to bypass the real kind of root cause of the problem, 
right? If you haven't really fixed it, you put like a band-aid on it, right? Um, so another kind of common way to address these issues are what we call structural fixes. So um, this is just when you target human behavior, so you're not, a, you're not ignoring that behavior anymore, but you're targeting it through some kind of change in the environment, so the social environment, political environment, um, kind of economic environment. Um, and so this is typically things like regulation, things like incentives. Um, uh, what we've seen in Ohio just in the last couple of years are new laws and legislation passed that actually ban farmers from applying nutrients on frozen ground in the winter or saturated ground. Um, and so that's an attempt to, to apply a structural fix, to say that, yes, your behavior is important, um, and I'm going to change something about the kind of environment in which you make decisions to make it harder for you to do that. Right? So suddenly now it's illegal. So yes, someone could certainly break that law, right? They can certainly keep doing it, uh, what they're not supposed to. Um, but I've made it a lot harder for people to do that. And economic incentives work the right way. You don't have to suddenly care about the lake or think that cover crops are good, but if I pay you enough, maybe you'll do it, right? So you're changing that behavior, but through a pretty direct kind of external way. Um, and then the last set of fixes are kind of where educational fixes fall, this idea of a cognitive fix. So here we're still targeting human behavior, but we're trying to change behavior using information and other sorts of um, mechanisms to actually change people's attitudes, change their beliefs, right? Increase their concern about their lake, increase their belief that um, these practices are actually going to work and they're actually going to be good for the farmer and also good for the lake. Um, and so this is the idea of designing outreach, uh, promoting the benefits of a practice, and again, trying to change behavior more through the kind of individual as opposed to the external environment that they operate in. So these are kind of three kind of categories of you know, types of solutions that are out there to address this issue or any sort of issue that might be out there. So in order to kind of think about this, um, part of what we want to do with our projects is to help identify which of those categories is best. So as a social scientist, I certainly want to change behavior. That's one of the things I'm interested in. So I'm more interested in the structural fix and the kind of cognitive fix. But I also have a lot of hope for, for cognitive fixes. So I don't think we always have to incentivize or like legislate things into action. I think sometimes you can motivate people to make changes on kind of their own accord. And so what we want to do with this project is to try to figure out is there a possibility for one of those other? What might be better? Um, what are farmers currently doing? How much kind of malleability is there in their behavior? So is there even an interest among enough farmers to change that we could ever get to those goals that we've been talking about? Um, and so what we've done over the last several years is actually three different surveys. Male surveys of corn and soybean farmers living in the Western Lake Erie Basin. Um, like I said, we just did our kind of last one this, this year, earlier in the winter. Um, and the target population and the samples have shifted a little bit over time, but pretty much um, pretty kind of standard, pretty similar. Um, our response rates have been pretty good to this. I mean, farmers are fairly concerned about this issue. And when you do like a general population survey, about an issue that people aren't necessarily super excited about. You might only get like 15% response because people aren't going to take the time. We're getting pretty good response rates on this. Um, and we're pretty happy with our samples. We've compared them to census data. Um, and we think we're really representing the right farmers when we look at this population. We're kind of over-representing bigger farms a little bit relative to um, what the ag census would say about farmers in these areas. But we also know that um, the bigger farmers are farming more of the land. So in terms of solving the problem and putting practices on, in place on enough land to actually fix the problem, it's actually good to focus on kind of bigger farms. Um, so again, I think we're kind of over-representing slightly bigger farms, and by bigger I'm talking like making $100,000 or more as opposed to like $50,000 a year. So not huge farms, but um, we're kind of ignoring some of those really small-scale farms that we don't think are having as big of an impact because they're farming a pretty small um, portion of the land in the watershed. And so the goals of this work has really been to identify the baseline kind of levels of um, recommended practices that are out there, to in some ways, kind of like Chris said, give a bit of a voice to the farmers and let them weigh in a little bit on this issue and let people know how they feel about it, what they really think. A lot of them feel like the fingers are being pointed at them and they're being kind of unfairly targeted, and so this is a way for us to kind of help them engage in the conversation. And then ultimately, we want to model the likelihood of future adoption of these practices um, in response to different kind of policy scenarios, um, to try to predict to what extent outreach efforts would be effective at actually getting changes in behavior. So that's our kind of end goal. So what do farmers think? So this is actually just data from our most recent survey, so it's the kind of most current opinion that I have from farmers on the issue. Um, and 77% of farmers think they have a good understanding of what we call the four R's of nutrient stewardship, which are, um, is kind of an outreach effort right now to really focus on precision in the way that nutrients are applied. So applying them at the right time, 
applying them at the right rate based on soil tests that kind of tell you what the soil needs. Um, so most farmers, again, have a pretty good understanding of that. 82% actually um, think about nutrient stewardship quite a bit as it relates to both water quality and farm profitability. Um, so it's something that's top of mind for, again, a good majority. 50% uh, have already participated in a new program that's been legislated that requires um, private applicators, so individual farmers, to get certified, kind of like they've always had to do for pesticides. Now they have to do it for fertilizers. So as of um, earlier this year, 50% of the farmers in our sample had already done that. 56% uh, report having changed practices on their farm in the last three years, and I think our data backs this up in a lot of ways, that we're actually seeing shifts in behavior since 2011. Um, and then 54% are concerned about their individual farms contributing to harmful algal blooms in this year, which is pretty good because in earlier surveys, um, there's been a little more finger pointing at other farmers. So we've seen a lot more of a response that, well, I'm doing a really good job, but it's so-and-so over here, right, or it's my neighbor who does really great things. Um, but we actually see 54%, a little over half now, saying, yeah, I actually do think about the impact that my individual farm is having. Um, but 77% are concerned about the negative impact of nutrient loss to their farm's profitability, right? And so that we kind of expect, and that's a lever you can pull to, right, in terms of the benefits of practices. You can show them that these practices are good for their individual kind of economic um, situation and not just good for the lake, right? That's going to have a bigger impact. You have a lot more people who are going to be thinking about that. Um, but generally, the, the lesson is here is that they're thinking about it, they're concerned about it, they're probably willing to do something about it. In fact, we have a section on the last survey where we asked about um, what they're most concerned about, and the highest thing that the most people were concerned about was additional regulation and lawsuits. So they're thinking about this a lot, and they're, they're very motivated to do something on their own before someone makes them do it, right? You'd much rather kind of decide how to address the problem through your own kind of means as opposed to being told or being slapped on the wrist. So here's just a table that's summarizing um, adoption rates over time from our survey data. So again, our first survey was in 2011. Some of the questions we've asked have changed a little over time based on, um, and this is kind of classic, so for anyone that's interested in interdisciplinary work, um, doing kind of couple systems things, you can try really, really hard to all be on the same page the entire time. Never happens. So as the project moves along, um, I'm picking on, I'm going to pick on Jay Martin who was here last week, so everyone that heard Jay talk last week. Um, he and I have tried to kind of communicate back and forth, well, we're going to ask farmers about this. What do your models say we should be asking them about? Okay, no, no. so we've tried to go back and forth and kind of coordinate, but as we know as scientists, things change over time. Things we thought were important early on, we focused a lot on dissolved reactive phosphorus early on. Now some of the models that Jay is working on and others um, are showing that to get those 40% reductions in total phosphorus, you might need to use something like filter strips, uh, which is focused more on particulate phosphorus. So we kind of quit asking about filter strips in our surveys because we were focused on soluble phosphorus. Um, so this is one of the challenges of interdisciplinary work is science has to kind of move forward and you try really hard to communicate and make sure your work can inform each other. And um, we're now at the end of the project to the point where we're all on the same page and so we're like running to get all of this stuff done that's really going <laughs> to integrate what we're doing. Um, so some of our data has changed over time, but you can see that we've seen positive changes, right? So we've seen an increase in adoption of cover crops from 8% to 22%. Uh, this is not a typo. Um, in 2016, we asked them what their plans were next year, and one option was I'm definitely going to do this, another option was I'm, I'm likely to do it, another was I'm unlikely to do it, and one was I'm never going to do this. So we can kind of predict for next year what we expect people might do. Um, so we've already seen um, almost a tripling in adoption of cover crops. Um, we see similar trends for a lot of other recommended practices, like not applying nutrients in the winter, um, not applying in the fall. This delaying broadcasting is just the idea that you should pay really close attention to um, weather forecasts in the spring. And if there's a, what is it, help me out people, a 50% chance of a one-inch rainfall event within 24 hours, um, that you should not apply fertilizer. You should wait. Right, for that 24 hours, apply 24 hours later. A kind of simple thing that probably any farmer could do, we've all got computers and apps and local weather forecasters, um, and it could have a really big impact, right? Because if you're not putting that fertilizer out there right before a big storm, that could have a big impact. That's when we see these big fluxes in phosphorus. Um, and so we're seeing some kind of small increases in that. Uh, fertilizer placement, this is the idea of putting the fertilizer beneath the surface of the soil as opposed to broadcast applying it across the surface. Um, and then just applying rates based on soil testing, which again, we've seen some pretty good increases in that. 
What this column shows you is it takes the people who said, I'm definitely going to do it in 2017, and it adds in the people who said, I'm likely to do it. So I call this my potential future column. So this is basically like, if, if we can just harness those people who said, yeah, I'm thinking about it, which from a communication standpoint is actually pretty easy, and I'll talk about that a little bit, um, this is what we could have in terms of adoption across the watershed. And this is kind of randomly distributed. This isn't targeted to certain types of farmers or certain geographic locations. Um, that could even amp up the effectiveness of some of these numbers, right? Um, and so for those of you who were here last week hearing Jay talk, one of the scenarios in the kind of hydrological models that they've been doing that actually looks like it could achieve the 40% reduction that's being recommended at a policy level was to get 58% of the farmers to adopt cover crops, and our potential future is 60, so not unreasonable. Um, to get 50% of farmers to do subsurface placement, our kind of potential future is 68%. And then the scenario that they were looking at included filter strips, so that's 78% adoption. Again, we haven't been looking at filter strips because it's more of a particulate phosphorus thing, um, and something like that's going to require incentives because you're going to be asking people to take land out of production and put these practices in place, whereas things like cover crops and fertilizer place placement um, can have a real economic benefit in the immediate short term and the longer term of cover crops, and so you don't necessarily have to incentivize those. So there's ways to, I think, get to maybe these target numbers without having to use economic incentives, without having to regulate, without having to use some of those other sorts of means. Does that make sense to everyone? So I think it's a good, I think it's a good picture. I think it's encouraging to see that things are kind of moving on their own um, and that we have a lot of possibility here. So we talk about this as kind of plasticity or malleability, right? But there's these behaviors that we can move. We can shift them, and I think there's a lot of potential to um, so how do we motivate those people? So if we've got 30 to 40 percent of our farmers who are saying, yeah, I might, I might do it, we possibly could do it, how do we get those people to actually take a step forward? Um, and so we've looked at a variety of things. Like I said, the most recent paper we've worked on has been focused on timing sorts of issues, so seasonal timing, like whether you apply in the fall, the winter, or the spring, um, this idea of delaying your application in the spring with a big storm event kind of looming on the horizon. So we have a paper coming out on that, and then literally this week, Jay came to my office and said, so scenario eight and our modeling, our integrated modeling, is filter strips, cover crops, and subsurface placement. I was like, ah, I haven't worked on those yet. So we're kind of going back to focus on the, that a little bit more. Um, but when we think about um, motivating the willing to take action, and if we kind of set aside regulation, we set aside incentives, we know that that can work. Um, I think any kind of good economist, though, would tell you that you know, there's sometimes things you can't pay people enough to do, so they're not always the solution, right? Sometimes there's other better ways to do it. One thing we also know from incentives um, is that it takes away any sort of intrinsic motivation. Somebody has to do the right thing. So once you start paying somebody to do it, that's why they're doing it. And so if you take that payment away, they'll quit doing it. Um, so that's the other problem, I think, that we don't think about kind of long term, is that you can't perpetually pay for that behavior. You might take away any kind of personal motivation to um, so when we think about these kind of cognitive fixes and how do we get someone to voluntarily just go out there and do something different, even if they're not being paid, even if it's not mandatory, um, even if it can be a little painful even in the short term, um, from a communication standpoint, when we look at a population of people, so this is a nice little kind of semi-normal curve, that's my best drawing on a PowerPoint slide, um, we assume that we can change these people in the middle. So for any sort of problem, you're going to get, if you randomly sample and ask people their opinion, you're going to get a normal distribution. You're going to get some real extreme folks, right? So for something like um, improving the lake or improving environmental conditions, you're going to have some people who hate the environment, who hate Lake Erie, who think light pollution is fantastic, right? So you're going to have this kind of small number of people out here with negative attitudes, kind of doing bad things. You're going to have a small number of people up here with really positive attitudes, doing really good things, right? I love the lake, and I'm a farmer who does all these innovative things for conservation. Um, but you're probably, you would assume you'd have a lot of people in the middle, right? A lot of people are kind of neutral, not super motivated either way. It's neither bad nor good. I don't know. I'm kind of indifferent. Um, and those are typically the people that we, we have the ability to change, right? Because they haven't developed a really well-formed opinion. They're kind of sitting on the fence trying to decide what to do. And typically, from a communication and outreach education standpoint, those are the only people you can change. You will never change these people. Um, we talk about this in the context of climate change, like denialists. You're not going to change them, so it's not even worth really trying. You've already got these people on your side, right? So these are the people you want to change. Um, so when we look at our data for farmers, and I'll just use this example of um, delaying broadcast application, a kind of timing example. 
our distribution actually looks at this, right? So only 13% of our farmers kind of fall into this, I'm never going to do this category. I think this is a bad idea. I'm not at all interested. 39% are already doing it, so they're already on our side, right? They're up here doing good stuff. And then 48% are kind of there going, yeah, maybe I'll do it, right? So our curve looks quite a bit different, right? So when we look at where the majority, where the kind of median is, if you think about it that way, it's around this kind of positive side of the curve, right? So you've got this big group of people who are already doing it, willing to do it, and that's really good from a kind of outreach, education, communication standpoint, right? You're not going to be fighting this kind of uphill battle to convince them that something is good. They're probably willing to do it if you can just get a few of the right things in place. Um, and so when we kind of think about that from the perspective of what solutions that we, do we have out there, um, often we think that the only way you can change those people who are really negative is to put those structural fixes in place, right? So you mandate it incentivize it, they're never going to buy into it kind of cognitively that it's a good thing, but they might do it if you kind of force them from an external standpoint. Um, and so we could certainly think about that. We could think about regulation and incentives for that kind of 13%, but I don't know that we need them, right? If we go back to that table of targets, right, there was nothing in those kind of hydrological models that said we needed 100% of people to do something, right? So we can probably just kind of ignore these people. Let's just put that out there. And I'm going to emphasize we can ignore them um, because they're not different. Either. Like when we look at demographic factors, when we look at farm characteristics, there's nothing different about these people other than, um, and here's the one thing, so I'll put this out there for policy-minded people in the room, they're more likely to use manure as a source of fertilizer. So for this particular timing-related practice, it makes a lot of sense. Because if I have to get rid of manure and there's a storm coming, I may not care, right? Because I just want to apply it and get rid of it. So that kind of makes sense. So there are these kind of factors that might be kind of hindering this kind of group of individual's behavior that are a little bit outside of their control, right? So if we can come up with kind of interesting structural solutions that will help them overcome that problem, we might actually be able to change them. Um, but, but other than that, there's really nothing different about them. In fact, the size of their farms are almost um, identical to the people up here already doing these practices. We don't see any differences in farm size or anything like that. Um, but as far as these kind of folks who are already on board, I think there's a lot of potential to use these cognitive fixes to kind of think about education as a tool to kind of change the way people think about it. Um, and what we're doing now is we're starting to, to run models looking at what are the kind of main factors that are driving adoption versus non-adoption, what are the kind of cognitive triggers that we could, we could pull or the levers we could pull to get people to change. Um, and like I said, when we look at those three groups, they don't differ. Um, like I said, the unwilling are pretty much the same in terms of their farm characteristics as the people already putting the practices in place. The one thing we can find is they're more likely to use manure. Again, for this particular practice, that's important. And they are concerned about unpredictable weather. So again, that makes a lot of sense. Because if I'm being told, you should wait 24 hours if there's a 50% you know, chance of a one in train fall event and I don't trust the weather forecast, I'm not going to do it. Right? Why would I do it? So for these people, they need higher confidence in the weather forecast. They need someone kind of helping them figure out when that's reliable and when it's not. Because they're out there wanting to spread manure and they don't trust the weather forecast. Right? So why, why would I ever consider doing this? Um, when we look at the future and the current adopters, we see that they are better informed about the four R's. So there is some kind of educational component that's different about those folks. They are more concerned about things like water quality, nutrients loss during kind of big spring rain, which again would make sense because this behavior is asking you to avoid big spring rain. So if you're more concerned about that. Um, and they're more likely to believe in the effectiveness of this practice. I actually believe that if I delay that application, I'm more likely to keep nutrients on my field. I'm more likely to have a positive impact on the lake, right? They've bought into that idea. Um, and we see this in almost every behavior we've looked at, every set of analyses we've done. This idea of efficacy, the effectiveness of the practice, the benefits of the practice is rising above kind of everything else as the thing that seems to be really motivating the people doing it and the people who are considering doing it. So if we can do a better job from an educational standpoint, promoting those benefits, showing them that it works, using field trials, examples from other farmers, right? Any sort of kind of mechanism that we can to get people to buy into the efficacy of that practice, I really think you'll see that 30 to 40% buy into it and, and potentially start doing it. So what we're working on right now are um, kind of the last thing, and I won't spend too much time on this. We can do some kind of simple analyses. We can kind of compare the means on these scores across these groups, kind of simple, fairly descriptive stuff. Um, but one of our hypotheses from a just social science standpoint is that um, farmers are more heterogeneous in their preferences than we give them credit for. So often I think we assume farmers are farmers, right? They're 
one person who has the same set of motivations, the same set of goals, right? They're doing practices for the same reasons. They just want to make money, right, because this is their occupation. Um, so what we're doing for each of these practices, and this is, again, just using this timing one as an example, is we're um, running latent class analyses, which allow us to kind of assume that farmers are actually pretty heterogeneous, that they're actually motivated by very different things. And it, this analysis is kind of like a cluster analysis using regression techniques, but it actually lets you do assign farmers to different classes or categories, and they have like a certain probability of belonging to a particular class. And each, in those classes, there's a certain probability of them doing, in this case, the particular behavior, our kind of dependent variable. So when we do this for these different practices, we tend to see three classes of farmers. So we certainly see evidence that farmers are a little more diverse and heterogeneous than we think, but there may be kind of these three categories or three classes of farmers. <laughs> Um, and interestingly, they often do vary in terms of their adoption rates. So for delaying broadcast application, um, our majority class, so 61% of our farmers have the kind of highest probability of falling into class one. Um, and that's our kind of low adoption class. They tend to be older farmers. Again, kind of makes sense. Um, I may be less likely to change my practices as I'm closer to retirement, kind of more ingrained in what I do. Um, they kind of have mid-sized farms on these kind of various scales. Um, we see kind of higher adoption rates among slightly younger farmers with slightly more income. Um, and then we see the highest adoption rates among our smallest class here for people with, um, this is kind of an odd result, but some of the really big farms who also have off-farm income. Which kind of makes sense because you're probably a little more tolerant to those risks. You're able to kind of absorb some of that uncertainty a little bit. Um, and so we're using these analyses to start to figure out, are there unique groups of farmers? Do they vary in their likelihood of adoption? Um, are there kind of unique things that explain why they're adopting? Are there common things? And so in every single one of the analyses, the only predictor that's common to all the classes of farmers is this idea of effectiveness and response attitude. So they're all motivated to do it when they have a stronger belief that the practices actually work, right? So kind of a no-brainer. Um, and then there's a whole set of things that vary in terms of kind of unique things. But from an outreach standpoint, this can be helpful because you can actually target outreach in different ways. Right? So you can maybe target your outreach towards, towards older farmers a little bit differently than you would towards younger farmers. Um, or you can take the least common denominator here and really focus on that and know that that's going to have a positive impact on pretty much everybody involved in the issue. Um, so just to summarize, farmers in the Western Lake Erie Basin are definitely engaged in the issue. Um, I think a lot of them are kind of doing good stuff um, and are largely willing to take on those additional practices. Um, like I said, 30 to 40 percent of the population is giving us this kind of indication that they're willing to do something different, but they haven't done it quite yet. And if those people did, we would easily, I think, reach some of those 40 percent reductions. And um, Jay and some of that team are actually going to do some new scenarios for me based on kind of different combinations from our um, survey, based on what our maximum future adoption could be, to see if there's maybe some other scenarios out there that don't even require filter strips, since that's an incentivized kind of practice. So we're going to play around with that a little bit. Um, but importantly, motivations and constraints can vary, right? Farmers are doing um, different management practices for different reasons, different types of motivations in some cases, and you have to think about that. Um, but again, I think there's this least common denominator. I think that we can, especially for that 30 to 40 percent, are kind of on the cusp of changing. I think we can kind of um, buckle down a little bit more on really targeting um, for those folks, how do these practices benefit you? Ultimately, how can you put this in place without having a kind of negative impact on profit in the short term? Um, we talked at dinner that a lot of these farmers, what they really want, and we hear this for all kinds of problems, is they want someone to come with them to their field and tell them exactly what to do, right? So for this field, with this slope, with this soil type, with this soil quality, with this type of yield, what's the right combination of things that I should be doing? And maybe we can't do that, but maybe we can get better at making more site-specific recommendations, right? And so that's going on right now with um, various extension efforts and other kind of statewide efforts to address the issue. So that's it. I'll just put a bunch of thanks. I won't read through this. We have summaries and reports of our uh, surveys online at our website if you're interested. And we have a lot of different papers at various stages. Um, and there's been a lot of people um, involved in this and have helped make this happen. So I just want to make sure I highlight them.
watershed, sure, there's big impact. But for all of Lake Erie, that's minuscule compared to the inorganic fertilizer issue. So how does that play in people's thinking when, you know, red herring keep on being put in and, you know, does it eroding their, their... Yeah, so I would, I would say, and I don't necessarily have, like, Realize it's the reason that he flies removed, so they get like 
film by playing, not that any kind of film is ever neat, but I was just kind of joking for fun, so um, you got to find more of him, I guess, to <laughs> um, But yeah, so I think there are some kind of incentives to offset the cost a little bit, but not as much as there would be for kind of taking acreage out of production. And, and I think in, in the discussions that I'm hearing, there's probably going to be less incentives for yeah. those specifically because they provide a benefit to the farmer. They do retain phosphorus. They do increase soil health. Yeah, and so Well, the other problem with cover crops is it takes three to five years to see the kind of soil health and nutrient retention benefit. And so, unless a farmer gets them established correctly and does it right for three to five years, you may not see any benefits. So, in that sense, you almost could argue if you can incentivize someone to do it right for long enough so they see the actual personal benefit, then maybe you could take away the incentive. But I think the concern is you take it away and then people get the benefit. Yeah. What, um, So for some of them we do. Um, so we've looked at everything from specific practices, like some of the ones I showed you here, um, to just the kind of willingness to take action. People with more rented acreage are less willing to take action generally speaking, which makes a lot of sense um, because we don't have a long-term commitment to that land. So one of the things we've talked about is just generally, so not practice specific, but generally speaking, if you want to increase willingness, you might need to start thinking about how leasing agreements are made, um, what kind of um, temporal kind of terms are placed on those, how you make sure that someone has that commitment. Um, we've even talked about, um, like one of the things we're looking at with the cover crop study is landlord pressure. So like, if you're actually renting, how do you get landlords to then say, well, yes, but in our agreement is you're using cover crop, right? So there would be lots of ways to kind of think about, I think, how you could deal with that, but it certainly makes people resist you know, investing more time and money. And there's a lot of other great questions out there, but we got to want to try and keep this on schedule. So I'm going to put it break in there. Usually we try and get the guest lecture started right around 8. Why don't we take like 10 minutes and start at 10 after. If you have a specific question for Robin, then you can, you can come on up if you're, if you're willing and able to do that. So if we could thank uh, Dr. <laughs> Let's just take like a 10 minute break. We'll start
uh, boundary waters, so the Great Lakes and you know all the rivers and, and lakes that sit on the U.S.-Canadian border. We specifically sit on a panel that's called the Research Coordinating Committee. And so part of our role is to figure out what are the big research questions and what are the big directions that, that we should be going as two separate countries to manage um, the resources, specifically aquatic resources. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with uh, Director Lee. Um, so the lab she runs in Ann Arbor is fantastic, and, and she'll give you a little glimpse into in some of the stuff that's going on. And, and so if you'd be the as I've asked with Dr. Wilson, she's going to give you how her career trajectory went for the brief introduction. So I don't want to um, belabor my talking up here, and then uh, and then she'll lead us through. So if we could, you could join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, or Director Lee. So not unlike Robin, my career has had twists and turns as well. Um, and I stand before you rather surprised. I'm I've done a full circle also, very similar to she has. But I started off uh, between my junior and senior year in high school when I received a, a grant from the National Science Foundation to attend a six-week engineering program at New High State University. So I spent a summer there, and I'm 17, and uh, they taught us calculus, which, by the way, was not offered at my rural high school. So for me, that was a really amazing opportunity. And they also taught us programming. Now, Programming then was not what you have today, right? We, we, we did punch cards. Uh, we had uh, green stripes print out. Uh, you had to feed the cards to a machine and wait till the next day to see if your program ran, right? Which is doing it over and over again. So I was amongst the first, uh, I guess, year, year class, <laughs> to use a biological term, that learned programming. And uh, from there, that so excited me. I decided I wanted to be an engineer. And I wanted to be a water resources engineer because I had always been interested in water resources growing up on the Ohio River. Um, so I completed an undergraduate degree at Ohio State University in civil engineering, went on to complete a master's degree where I got to work with Dr. Keith Bedford, um, who's been very instrumental and maybe known to many of you. He's retired now, but he was the dean of civil engineering uh, before he retired. And he is one of the um, people who's behind the Great Lakes Operational Forecasting System. And I was amongst one of the first students that got to help develop portions of that and begin that. Uh, from there, I went on to work for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. And I, I had uh, three choices to choose at that time, but I chose the Army Corps because they actually managed the waters of the Great Lakes. They regulated Lake Superior, Lake Ontario, the Niagara River, the Yankton River. And I wanted to work managing the water on this big scale. So I worked there for several years. And um, this was a hard lesson I learned early, because I was also in the first early class where it was still considered unusual for a woman to be an engineer. Okay? There were still a lot of barriers, unfortunately. And I kind of hit a ceiling, a glass ceiling there, the first one of a couple um, there at the Corps of Engineers. And I received an opportunity, an offer, to come over to the Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory, where I work now, um, as their first female principal investigator. And so I served there as a research technologist for a number of years um, and enjoyed that very much. Again, continuing to work on the Great Lakes and looking at how to manage the Great Lakes. Um, then uh, my husband, who's in the back room, had a promotion opportunity. And we had to make a tough choice. Um, I was working on my PhD. Uh, were we going to go? And and so we made that decision. So I left the laboratory, but through networking, which is something you'll learn to do and which I strongly encourage you to do, I learned of another job uh, still with NOAA that was in the area we were moving to. So I went and actually joined the National Weather Service. And I became an operational forecast hydrologist there for the Ohio River. So I was back working on the Ohio River that I grew up and loved. Um, I worked there for three years. Uh, but my real love was still in that hands-on operational management. And so an opportunity came back with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers at the division office in Cincinnati. And I was the only <coughs> applicant at that time who had both Ohio River and Great Lakes experience. So what turned out, what I first thought was maybe a step back, leaving the Great Lakes and leaving that work, going to the Ohio River, turned out to be actually a benefit because I added a whole new skill set uh, to my career, and it made me the prime candidate for this job um, at the division office that oversaw seven districts, the Ohio River and the Mississippi, uh, part of the Mississippi, the Great Lakes, more than 90% of our nation's water. Um, 
And I apprenticed there for four years and then was actually promoted to be the chief of water management division. So I actually was responsible for managing the largest reservoirs east of the Mississippi River for ensuring we met the Boundary Waters Treaty for Lake Superior and Lake Ontario, working with the International Joint Commission. And um, I had a lot of great experiences. I got to be the engineer who developed Plan 2014 um, for Lake Ontario, which you may have heard about, a 15-year uh, effort, uh, more than $20 million study between Canada and the U.S. And we're just now in the final stages of getting it pushed through the government process to hopefully get it implemented. And it would restore over 64,000 acres of wetlands without us having to build any structures or do any and I also uh, regulated the Ohio and Mississippi through the Greater Mississippi River Flood of 2011. So I actually made all the technical decisions working for a two-star general um, and working across um, the divisions with the Missouri River Division, uh, uh, the Northwest Division that operated the Missouri, Mississippi Valley Division that operated the Upper Mississippi and the Lower Mississippi. And we managed through that record flood a lot of people didn't hear about it because we did everything right, and all the flood structures worked. And we prevented $234 billion of damages to the United States. And we uh, preserved our nation's billion-dollar investment in the Mississippi River levee system and all the agricultural land that helped is really our breadbasket to the farm nation. Um, so that was a very strenuous time, very tumult tumultuous time, uh, having that level of responsibility. Um, did a lot of other things, the first biological opinion uh, that our division did, where we lowered Lake Cumberland. I don't know if any of you have been to Kentucky and Tennessee, the land between the lakes. Uh, but we had to do dam safety remediation on that lake, and that required a biological opinion. So uh, a lot of great opportunities. Um, but then I had this opportunity to come back to Laurel now as the director and in what is called a senior executive service. So in the federal service, uh, you work your way up. And the very top tier of service in the federal government is a senior executive service. Um, there's only 5,000 of us in the nation. And we are the backbone of our nation's uh, civil service in running the federal programs for the government. We provide the stability between administration changes. We provide the uh, long-term policy, long-term guidance. Um, and it's uh, really a privilege to be able to serve at that level in the federal government. So I um, just wanted to let you know that I can tell you more about careers in the federal government if you'd like to know later um, about how that works. But uh, I think it's exciting, very rewarding. I've gotten to work on a scale, uh, on projects, with responsibilities that very few people get to have. So, so it's, I've been very pleased and happy to serve. Uh, the government in, in my capacity. Um, with that uh, being what I'd like to do is I'd really like to tell you about NOAA, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, <clears throat> so you know more about what we do. I want to tell you more about what we do in the Great Lakes, and then I'll drill down even to be more specific about what we do here in Lake Erie, Western Lake Erie, Ohio. Um, and I'd really love to have you ask me questions as I go along. Uh, just raise your hand or just even just shout out the question. Um, if I don't see you, stand up and I'll be more than happy so that I know it's getting late in the day, so I don't want anybody to fall asleep. <laughs> so, so. You'll have to excuse me for using notes, but um, I often go from one thing to the other, and so it's very helpful to me um, to be able to have the notes remind me of a few details. I can advance. Well, oh, no, I have to turn it on. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Okay. So I already told you about, you know, I'll tell you about NOAA, and then I'll drill down, and I'll tell you a little bit more about some of the unique things we do related to the harmful algal blooms as well. So just to give you uh, some idea of the breadth and uh, scope of the Great Lakes, it's the largest freshwater system on Earth. It's a chain of lakes that range from Lake Superior down through um, Huron to uh, Lake Erie and then on to Ontario and out the St. Lawrence River to the Atlantic. Um, it contains 95% of the United States fresh surface water and it, in their volume they contain 6 quadrillion gallons 
and that would submerge the United States in 10 feet of water if we spread it out over the surface area of the United States. And at 94,000 square miles in surface area, it's the single largest supply of surface fresh water. So it is very important. It uh, is important um, in that uh, it also um, has a total watershed, including the lake, of 295,000 square miles. And you can see that uh, Lake Superior is, is actually the deepest. It actually goes below sea level. Um, you can see how shallow Lake Erie is. They're connected by rivers, the St. Mary's River. And you can see this black mark denotes the regulation structure, where we actually manage the flow, make decisions. Uh, Michigan, Huron, and Lake Erie are not regulated. They have uh, natural uh, constraints, one here at Lake uh, Niagara River, where the Niagara Falls are, and then the connecting channels to St. Clair Detroit River between them. And then Lake Ontario, which then has a series of man-made structures, navigation locks and dams, hydropower facilities uh, that control the outflow of Lake Ontario and then flow out to the ocean. And, and by the way, these structures, which have enabled a lot of the great economic development here in the Great Lakes, also provided a pathway for the most harmful invasive species, um, either naturally, such as the sea lamprey, as they progressed up the St. Lawrence River to the lake uh, on, on their own once they could get through those passages, um, or through ballast water, so, such as the zebra and quagga mussels, which came in through ballast water in ships. So it's been both uh, a blessing and uh, a, a, a disbenefit to us to have these improvements. Um, another thing that's surprising is most people don't know that the Great Lakes coastline, the U.S. coastline alone, is greater than twice the length of the Atlantic. So it's really combined with the uh, Canadian shoreline as well, the most coastline uh, of any of our coasts in the great in the United States, including the Gulf of Mexico or the Pacific. So uh, there's a lot of opportunity here uh, for those of us who love to understand coastal processes, coastal community resilience, uh, to practice. Um, there's also 105 million people, uh, which is approximately 33 percent of the United States. A population that live in the eight states bordering the Great Lakes, and there are 37 federally recognized American Indian tribes in the Great Lakes as well. I, I touched upon the economy. Uh, the Great Lakes directly sustain more than 1.5 million jobs, and they generate $62 billion in annual wages. Uh, the region's gross domestic product in 2015 was $5.8 trillion, or 28% of the combined U.S. and Canadian economic activity. So we're really a powerhouse of economic activity in this region. Um, the lakes also provide drinking water to 40 million people in the United States and Canada. They provide 56 billion gallons of water per day for municipal, agricultural, and industrial use. And the Great Lakes commercial and recreational fisheries contribute more than $7 billion to the regional economy. So now I've told you a little bit about the, the Great Lakes as a system. Let me tell you now about NOAA itself, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, it's a federal organization within the Department of Commerce. And our headquarters are located in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside D.C. That's the tip of D.C., right at the top of the, the diamond. And uh, NOAA's focus as an agency is to enrich our lives through science. And our reach goes from the surface of the sun, where we do solar flare forecasting, down to the depths of the ocean floor, where we do deep oceanic exploration. And we work to keep citizens informed of the changing environment around them. We execute a mission through our five major line offices, uh, yet there are many interconnections and interdependencies amongst those five line offices that help us fulfill our goal of science, service, and stewardship. Uh, so for example, in our efforts to monitor and forecast um, changes in climate, that's made possible by working across these five line organizations. So starting with the National Weather Service, which is often our most recognized element because that's our public state. Everybody recognizes our blue symbol with the, with the bird. You 
see that on the Weather Channel on your TV station, your local TV station. Uh, that produces our nation's weather forecast and public warning uh, for both weather and water. So um, that's used to help protect life and property. Um, and one of the things that's very interesting is we support very, uh, uh, we work very closely, they work very closely with FEMA in working through disasters such as like Sandy and uh, uh, hurricanes and such to keep us prepared. Um, the next line is the line that I'm in, oceanic and atmospheric research. And we conduct the research that helps inform the science of the other five line organizations. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, then we have the National Environmental Satellite Data and Information Service, NESDIS. These have the GOES satellites uh, that develop all our remote sensing and geostation, uh, geostationary Earth observing satellite systems. And you'll see a little bit more how that actually relates to Lake Erie uh, in a bit. And then we have the National Ocean Service. And they try to they work to provide science-based solutions to collaborative partnerships uh, to address uh, evolving economic, environmental, and social pressures uh, on our oceans and coasts. And then we have the National Marine Fisheries Service, which interestingly is not in the Great Lakes, and I'll tell you why in a second. But they uh, ensure that they protect our marine resources for commercial fishing, and they also have some responsibilities for endangered uh, marine. Um, but why uh, National Marine Fisheries doesn't work in the Great Lakes is the Great Lakes are fresh water. They are considered the state water, not federal water. They're considered to belong to the state. So the state and Canada have formed the Great Lakes Fishery Commission, and they manage the fishery jointly through that process. Um, what our NOAA's drivers and priorities are? Uh, we have a set of uh, international agreements, such as the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement of 1978 that was amended again in 87 and most recently in 2012. And that's an agreement between Canada and the United States, which involves restoring and enhancing the water quality of the Great Lakes system. So that's an example of one international uh, mandate. And there are many more uh, between other countries as well that uh, drive the work that NOAA does. Uh, there's also examples of U.S. legislation, such as the Aquatic Nuisance Species Program and the Harmful Algal Bloom and Hypoxia Research and Control Act of 1998. Uh, and then we also have interagency agreements, uh, the most recent example of which is through the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We have been very fortunate uh, that under the current administration, uh, we as a region in the United States have been receiving between about 250 to $300 million per year in appropriations to help restore the, uh, the Great Lakes. And we're doing that through a team of 16 federal agencies in partnership with the states and tribes and local entities um, to do uh, restoration and uh, research that produces measured progress, measurable progress in restoring the environment of, of the Great Lakes. Uh, EPA receives that money, but we manage it collectively through a regional working group um, of the federal agency. Uh, now, to tell you a little bit more about oceanic and atmospheric research, which is where my laboratory resides, we have a number of laboratories uh, scattered across the nation, and they all have their own um, focus. So, uh, GLURL, which is Great Lakes Environmental Research Laboratory focuses on the Great Lakes, and we do whole systems research. We look at the physical, dynamical, and biological health of the Great Lakes. Uh, we have two other what we call sister laboratories, uh, the Pacific Marine Environment Lab that focuses on the Pacific and the Arctic, uh, similar to how we focus on the Great Lakes. And then we have the Atlantic uh, Ocean Marine Laboratory, which focuses on the Atlantic and the Gulf. And then uh, they also do a lot of the hurricane research <coughs> as well that helps support the National Weather Service and the National Hurricane Center. Uh, we have um, NASA, uh, the National Severe Storms Laboratory, which many of you see on the Weather Channel all the time, the storm chasers. You see them going after the tornadoes. But their specific role is to be able to understand the science behind uh, that severe weather and tornado and then help inform that with the National Weather Service to do their weather warning. 
And then ESRO is a series of four laboratories that study um, global Earth systems. So they help develop the global models that are used by the National Weather Service and other countries around the world to predict um, the global weather. And then uh, the Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Laboratory uh, looks at um, developing dynamic models of the oceans and the atmosphere and the interaction between those two. And then we also have the Air Resources Lab, which looks at monitoring pollution and the science behind pollution and the transport of pollution. To tell you just a little bit more about how we work in the Great Lakes specifically and what has driven us, it's been an evolution since, uh, actually since 1909 when the International Joint Commission was established to uh, manage the shared waters between the United States and Canada. It's been a century long of mutual collaboration that has allowed us to successfully manage those waters where many countries have devolved into water wars or have uh, irreconcilable differences over the uses of water. We have successfully shared the water with Canada through under the auspices of the International Joint Commission. Um, then beginning with the environmental awakening, um, in the 70s, uh, the first Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement came about where we recognized that what we did for the water quantity under the International Joint Commission, we needed to do for the biological and chemical integrity of the Great Lakes. And we now have a very robust um, process through the Great Lakes Water Quality Agreement uh, by which we are continuing to improve the chemical and physical and biological integrity of the system. Uh, Gloro NOAA is actually rather new. President Nixon established it in 1974 by reorganizing several agencies, uh, formerly the Weather Bureau and uh, several others, the fish, uh, Fisheries Management, and uh, we evolved and uh, continue to evolve today. So we're actually very young compared to many federal agencies. Um, then I mentioned the Water Quality Agreement, uh, the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative, and um, the Great Lakes Regional Collaboration which actually set the strategy that has been driving the restoration initiative today um, in terms of the actions that we're taking in restoration measures. So NOAA, with its five uh, separate stovepipes, um, actually to integrate across those in the region so we can deliver better services, um, actually has what we call Great Lakes Regional Collaboration and we work to uh, facilitate collaborating, uh, facilitate coordinating our efforts for the Great Lakes. Shown here on this map, everywhere you see a NOAA symbol is actually a physical facility of NOAA, so a brick and mortar building um, that represents all the different elements of NOAA. Uh, many of those are weather forecast offices that actually produce the weather forecast for your local area. Uh, we have the river forecast centers, one in uh, near Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, one in Taunton, Massachusetts, one in Chantassin, Minnesota, uh, that produced the flood forecast uh, for the nation and specifically for this region. Um, we have our laboratory here in Ann Arbor and our field station on Lake Michigan is located here. Uh, and then we have a couple other few uh, other very interesting elements um, such as the Midwest Regional Climate Center in Urbana-Champaign, Illinois. Uh, we have our National Ocean Service Response and Restoration Office located in Chicago. Um, we also have a remote sensing um, center as well, Ceres, uh, which is located also up in the Chicago, uh, Wisconsin, Madison, the Madison, Wisconsin area. So it's quite interesting. And our sanctuaries, we have uh, the Thunder Bay National Marine Sanctuary in Alpena, uh, Michigan, that maybe some of you have visited there as well. So, and then I don't want to neglect Sea Grant because that's the organization that Chris fits in and that we're at here today. Uh, sea Grant is also at all the major, at the, at, uh, in each state at a major university, uh, land grant university. Um, these are the members of our regional collaboration team. I get to serve as the uh, the regional team leader, and I have a full-time regional coordinator, Jennifer Day. Um, and then we pull people from all the other line offices to form a committee that helps to plan activities and processes and to actually communicate those as well for the Great Lakes region. 
Uh, we recently established a communications and outreach working group um, that helps strengthen our ties to the Great Lakes Sea Grant program as well, and also helps us reach out and communicate with messaging to Congress on the Hill. Uh, bringing NOAA a little bit closer to home, um, we have the Old Woman Creek Reserve, which is one of the 28 areas in our National Estuarine Research Reserve System, and one of two that are in the Great Lakes region. You can see that located here at Old Woman Creek. Um, the Old Woman Creek Reserve is protected for long-term research, water quality monitoring, education, and coastal stewardship. Local management of that reserve is provided by the Ohio Department of Natural Resources Division of Wildlife uh, with the assistance from local partners. And our National Ocean Service Office for Coastal Management provides the funding, the national guidance, and technical assistance. So this Ohio reserve was the first freshwater estuary in the Great Lakes in the reserve system. And the site features freshwater marshes, swamp forests, a barrier beach, uplands forest, and a riparian stream. Because many of you currently working or studying here at Stone Lab, you're likely already aware that we have the National Ocean Service Office for Response and Restoration's Great Lakes Marine Debris Program uh, located here. And I noticed uh, Chris showed me a display that's been put over in the <coughs> center, uh, the visitor center, focused on uh, marine uh, debris that was funded through that program. Uh, Sarah Lowe is our Great Lakes Regional Coordinator for that program, and she works out of Oak Harbor in Ohio, and she works very closely with Sea Grant in the lab. Um, so there are many litter types that we experience here in the Great Lakes. Uh, there are microplastic problems. There's derelict fishing gear. And while we find that some of the plastic breaks down into smaller pieces, it never fully degrades in the water. Um, and so we're doing uh, research to understand what the impact is of that um, in the Great Lakes. Uh, another uh, thing we do very close to home is we work very hard to transition our research to operational products that are useful for stakeholders. And our most recent example is uh, the Lake Erie Operational Forecast System. It's uh, driven by meteorological data from a network of buoy, airports, uh, coastal land stations, and weather forecasts, uh, which provide the air temperatures, the dew points, winds, and cloud cover needed to drive this mathematical model. And the mathematical model predicts water levels, temperatures, and currents. And we just recently, this March, uh, implemented the second version of it, a substantial upgrade, which has provided a much higher resolution um, of forecasts, particularly in the near shore coastal area and around the islands. Um, and we're in the process of doing that for the other Great Lakes. Uh, over the next four years, we will do that for each of the other lakes in turn. Um, and while we at GLORAL developed that model, it actually goes to the National Ocean Service where it is run operationally on their large uh, high performance computing system. And they have people who operate them 24 by 7, which we can't do at the research laboratory. Um, we also uh, disseminate the forecast um, through the National Weather Service. And um, as I mentioned before, the river forecast centers as well. And you can see. Here are all the forecast points um, that the Ohio River Forecast Center produces a stream gauge forecast for, or flood forecast. We're also on the cusp of a new major innovation. Uh, you may have heard of it. It's called the National Water Model. It is in the process of being tested now in NOAA's new National Water Center in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and where we will be going from uh, 5,000 forecast points across the nation, we're going to be going to over 25,000 forecast stream segments uh, in the nation. It will be a major advance in how we predict and forecast water and how we disseminate that information. So watch for more to come on that. It's an exciting time. That model will do for water what our atmospheric models have done for weather prediction. Uh, and I did mention that NOAA Fisheries does not manage the Great Lakes fisheries, but due to Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding, they are doing habitat restoration, and they're doing that within the Great Lakes. Uh, we have some of the fishery people sitting in the laboratory co-located with us, and they're working on uh, restoring some of our most degraded environments designated as areas of concern. 
and they're working on reversing environmental damages uh, that result from oil spills, chemical releases, and marine debris. And they're also addressing the habitat loss that has diminished fish and wildlife populations. So here is a picture of work they're doing at uh, the Lake Erie Marsh, at, um, underway in the Lake Erie Marsh. And they're working on um, helping to address issues of regulating the water into and out of the wetlands, um, as most wetlands now are diked in Lake Erie now. And they hope to be able to improve uh, the fish passage, uh, restore the coastal wetlands, and remove invasive species from these wetland areas. And they've been awarded about $13.5 million to do projects in the state of Ohio. You can see here um, all the projects that have been funded in the state of Ohio through NOAA, through GLRI. Um, and they're listed here. And you can see the amount of money. Um, $8 million is being spent along the, in the Maumee River, um, 5.6 in the Black River area of concern. And you can see the host and range of uh, products and partners that are involved with that. Uh, shown here is my laboratory uh, in the upper picture. Tell you a little bit more about GLORAL itself. Um, this is a 45,000 square foot research facility. Um, and it's been customized for our specific use. It has 101 offices, five conference spaces, including a 150-seat lecture hall. It has 17 laboratories, of which 11 are wet labs and six are dry labs. We have two computer laboratories, 14 storage areas, and a 10,000 square foot uh, wear yard here where we can actually stage uh, work that we do. We also have our field station located in Muskegon, Michigan. We have three uh, buildings located there that we work out of, including the historic 1904 Coast Guard, uh, Life Saving Station. It wasn't Coast Guard then, but it was originally called a Life Saving Station. And we've restored that to and are preserving it for historical, as a historical building. Uh, we did receive $1.4 million uh, this year, and we will be uh, rebuilding our Building 3 into a state-of-the-art uh, freshwater laboratory there on site. Um, our vessels are housed here as well, uh, including the 80-foot uh, Laurentian, which is um, we actually lease from the University of Michigan and is our largest vessel. And then we have a series of other vessels uh, in the 55 to 30-foot range and a few in the 25-foot range, uh, which allow us to um, do research not only in Lake Michigan, but Lake Superior, Lake Huron, and Lake Erie. Uh, fortunately, Lake Ontario is too geographically far in extent for us, so we don't have any footprint at this point in time on Lake Ontario, other than through our Sea Grant program and our cooperative work with academic institutions and the state and other federal agencies. Um, something very interesting to know um, is that in 1999, Glorel began the first Green Ship Initiative, and we led the nation by successfully converting our diesel-powered vessel fleet to biofuels and biolubricants. Um, so this effort produced the very first federal vessel to run completely on non-petroleum products. Um, it's run by uh, what's called B100, which is 100% soy biodiesel, and it's uh, truly a renewable energy source. Um, and this is even a significant advancement over the blend of 20% biodiesel and 80% uh, petroleum diesel. So we were amongst the first, and other uh, agencies have adopted that, such as the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, for some of their Great Lakes vessels. Uh, Laurel's innovative. We do a wide variety of research. Um, shown here um, is, oops, sorry, um, is one of the five uh, lighthouses on which we have eddy covariance stations. Eddy covariances are, allow us to measure atmospheric fluxes that allow for over lake evaporation to be estimated. And why this is important is because one of the, one of the primary ways that the Great Lakes lose its water is through lake evaporation. And it also contributes to um, intense over lake um, or near shore lake effect snow. Um, so by being able to better measure and then model that lake evaporation, we can better predict snow events and the amount of water leaving through the Great Lakes through evaporation. Um, 
it's also one of the very few places where we can have observations during the winter uh, because we have to remove our buoys from the lakes because they freeze. And um, it's one of the very few places where we can get meteorological observations in the lake during the winter period. Uh, shown in the center is the new environmental sample processor, as we affectionately call it, a lab and can. Uh, you don't see the can right now housing it, but this is its inside. And it will actually be here in July 25th, uh, where we'll be doing the first um, testing of the chemical assay portion. This is a new technology. They have only been tested and deployed in the saltwater marine environment. And this is the very first freshwater deployment. It's also the only one in the Great Lakes. Um, that was made possible for us to acquire this technology uh, due to the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative funding. Um, it will be deployed in Lake Erie itself after this test here in July uh, near the Toledo water intake. So it will sit on the bottom of the lake and actually be able to measure toxins real time when they're present and then communicate those via cellular technology back to the laboratory. So we do that now traditionally by vessels, taking our vessels, taking a sample of water, taking it back to the laboratory. This will enable us to do it directly and get that information in much more near real time. Hopefully, if it's successful, we will be able to um, deploy more of them in the future. And then shown here is something called a mock nest, uh, affectionate name. Uh, it stands for a multiple opening and closing net environmental sampling system. And what it is is it's actually a series of nets. They're compressed right now on the rack. Uh, but when it's deployed in the water, they uh, expand out accordion-like. And you can now sample uh, the biological, um, uh, the biology at different elevations in the water simultaneously. And that's not something that we could do before. So this is really helping us support understanding the spatial study of uh, the biology of the Great Lakes, which actually is turning out to be very interesting and, and very informative. Some of those are some of the new technologies that we've been deploying. Um, our work is also very relevant. We continue to focus on aquatic invasive species, the climate, fluctuating Great Lakes water levels, and of course the harmful algal blooms. We also are very collaborative. Just here is just shown a sampling of the agencies and acad academic uh, institutions and others that we work with to do our science. Uh, one thing unique about um, NOAA is that we do a lot of our work through others. Uh, so we have a contingency of federal employees like myself and federal scientists, but actually most of our workforce, more, more than half, is comprised of uh, people who are in our cooperative institutes. Uh, so we have a cooperative institute uh, with the University of Michigan and affiliated, other affiliated universities like Ohio State. And so we actually grant money to them to help perform the work of NOAA. And it's a great way to bring in a broad array of talent, fresh thinking, and allow us to be flexible as a federal agency. So it's a great, a great thing for us. Uh, shown here are our core competencies. And I will talk to you a little bit more about um, the harmful algal bloom. And I've already touched upon several of these. Uh, items. One thing I have not touched upon is our ice research monitoring and forecasting. Uh, we maintain a long-term spatial database of ice cover in the Great Lakes, uh, which has also been very informative to being able to forecast that process and then also understanding the climatology and then seeing the impacts of climate change as evidence in that record of ice cover, where we've seen a declining ice cover uh, over the last decade and a half. In conjunction with our Cooperative Institute and many other partners, such as Ohio Sea Grant here at Stone Lab, uh, we're working on developing predictive models uh, to develop an integrated approach to uh, addressing harmful algal blooms. Um, our research is focused on the ability to predict when the cyanobacterial blooms will occur, whether they'll be toxic or not, and then to identify the influence of nutrients on the growth and extent. I talked already about the ESP. You can see it here. 
uh, when it's in its can and in its landing sled, which weighs over 500 pounds, to keep it firmly on the bottom of the uh, lake. Um, and they actually convinced me to buy a new boat just so they could <laughs> have one that could have a crane that could handle that load. So um, that will be out here as well this summer. Uh, I talked about Nestus and the environmental products. Here's an example of how we use them in the Great Lakes. Uh, we use satellite and airborne remotely sensed data to provide the accurate and synoptic retrievals of key Great Lakes parameters, such as the chlorophyll. Uh, the CDOM and suspended minerals. We actually use this to initialize our harmful algal bloom tracker uh, that can forecast the prediction, uh, forecast the movement of the harmful algal blooms across the lake. Something new we're doing is we have a hyperspectral detection uh, using a resonant PICA 2 sensor. It's actually uh, strapped to the airplane. And it flies over Lake Erie, and you can see its flight paths here as it remotely uh, detects chlorophyll and, and other parameters to help us address harmful algal blooms. And why we're doing this research is because when we have cloud cover, the satellite images cannot help inform or initialize our model. So by using this method, we hope to be able to have additional information uh, when we have harmful algal blooms by which we can uh, initialize our model. We'll also be investigating with um, uh, remote um, autonomous aircraft vehicles as well, or drones in the near future for that sensing as well. And then lastly, I touched upon the HAB tracker. Um, it's on an online web product. You can go see now. It's currently called Experimental because we run it at the laboratory. We have not yet transferred it to the National Ocean Service for 24 by 7 operation, uh, but it's a tool that combines remote sensing, monitoring, and modeling uh, to produce the daily uh, five-day forecast of the bloom transport and concentration. So it takes the daily satellite imagery and the real-time monitoring uh, to estimate the expanse and intensity of the bloom, and then we use the forecasted meteorology and hydrodynamic modeling to see where it will travel and what concentrations will likely be seen on a three-dimensional scale. And the three-dimensional aspect is important because when we have wind, the bloom, the algae actually mixes through the depths of the water, the toxins can mix through the depths of the water, and the water intakes are actually at depth, they're not at the surface. So that will be able to give us better predictions of when we can have impacts on our water supply. And uh, lastly, just as another example, we have drifters. We put out a drifter. Uh, we can, uh, Early in July, you can see it's an interesting path as it has wound its way across um, the lake between the two drifters. And we use this to help do verification of our models that predict the current. And so it's just another aspect of the physical type of science that we do. Uh, we also are predicting hypoxia um, uh, for the central basin of Lake Erie. This is very important for the city of Cleveland because during certain periods, the hypoxic water will well, up, will well up and come close to their water intake. And it causes uh, color, odor, um, and problems that could cause uh, lead in pipes to leach uh, if that hypoxic water gets in the system and is untreated. So uh, we're working on a real-time forecast model, and we also have a buoy located near the water intake to help predict um, hypoxic and lastly, we do do some social science. Uh, we would love to do a lot more. We're doing this presently through our Cooperative Institute, uh, shown as Ms. Sonia uh, Joshi, and she heads up our HABS communication for GORAL and our Cooperative Institute. And she's going to be doing a series of focus workshops this summer uh, with fishing, sport fishing and charter boat captains to understand the impact of harmful algal blooms on their business. And with that, I've kind of given you a whirlwind <laughs> tour. Uh, but I'd really love to uh, I answer any questions you might have. If you'd like to know more about NOAA or any of the specific work that we do. <laughs> we also have a summer fellowship program as well. Um, and I'd encourage you, if you're interested, it, um, we put out the um, 
applications in February, and I just encourage you to check, <coughs> you check your website in January for the following summer. And what uh, kind of degrees, are there certain backgrounds that you hire for those fellowships? Are you looking for chemists or limnologists, biologists, so does it run the gamut? Or it runs the full gamut of physical, biological, and even uh, laboratory hygiene. Uh, this summer we hired our first summer intern focused on safety and, and laboratory hygiene. I've always wondered, your your main building is in Ann Arbor, mm -hmm. but your field station is over in North Carolina. How does that all that? Well, we needed to have access to the lake, and we needed to have um, uh, a, a, we needed to have interaction with the community because the work that we do relates to community. So we needed to ensure we understood uh, that relationship, and so we found this avail this site available. I about 10 or 12 years ago, we selected this site, um, and it actually was given to us from the Coast Guard. So they no longer wanted it; they moved to a new facility. And so we've been working on improving it since that time to make it suitable uh, for um, lab for our laboratory. Not only were we happy to bring Director Lee here because of all the influential things she's done in the lake, but we want to show her that this resource is available too. Yeah. So even asking about you know how how much we draft coming in. So that we can show the customers that we can do that. So, you know, we've been working with all the labs to really share the assets that exist here. So, you know, I'm happy to have Director Lee here to see if she can use anything that we have to offer. Vice versa. Director, we have a question. So, when you showed the, the Ohio River, the, the river forecast stuff, mm -hmm. and the dots look like the gauging stations that were there? Yes. Are those all NOAA gauging stations, or how does that relate to the USGS? A lot of those, and I'd say predominantly the majority, are U.S. Geological Service cooperative program gauges. Uh, so those gauges are funded uh, through a variety of means. The state of Ohio provides money towards it. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers provides money towards them. The U.S. Geological Survey through base appropriations provides money to them. Even local communities provide money to them. had a record increase um, over the last uh, year from a period on Lake Huron and Michigan and Superior that was at a record low for over nearly 15 years. Um, and they rebounded uh, primarily because we had two uh, hard, cold, severe winters, as was mentioned, cap the uh, lake evaporation. And also we had above normal precipitation. So those combined caused that dramatic rise. Um, the lakes are at above average now. And they're expected over the next six months to remain above average, I think with the exception of Lake Ontario. But it's regulated, so they can bring it down faster um, than the other lakes. Um, but we can't really predict the Great Lakes water levels beyond the six months because we don't have the ability to forecast the weather with enough clarity beyond that, that period. And even at six months, it, you've seen the, the probabilistic band, the range at which it could be, you see it becomes quite wide. There's a lot of uncertainty at six months. A lot of people ask in Erie, like when we get a heavy rain event, how are you going to see the lake? Well, pretty much Lake Erie is driven by the upper Great Lakes. So the, the ice cover and, the, and when she says precipitation, a lot of that for us comes from the, the upper Great Lakes. Yeah, I think, I think it's about 70% of Lake Erie's uh, water comes from the upper lakes. And it's about 30% from its safety. Our new screen, but again, we don't have whoa, we don't have a guest lecturer for um, next week. So we will have our research experience for undergrad presentations. So for those of you that aren't in the RE program, rather than starting at seven with a research lecture and then eight at a guest lecture, we start right after dinner. So six o'clock, please come up and see your uh, your peers present on the work that they've been working on for the next five weeks, um, and that will kind of culminate their experience here. So thanks for your evening, and uh, everybody have.